Hi, welcome to this talk on capillary leak, fluids and the glycocalyx. My name is Ashley Miller and I'm a consultant intensivist in Shrewsbury. And before we go into more detail, it's important to realise that there are different types of capillaries. There are specialised ones in the liver, kidneys and gut that have specific functions I'm not going to go into. The ones that interest us for this talk are the most abundant. These are non-sinusoidal, non-fenestrated capillaries that are found in muscle, skin, connective tissue, lungs and our brains. And we're going to look at how the structure of these capillaries influences IV fluid prescribing and vasopressor use. In medical school, we learned about the Starling model to explain fluid flow across capillaries. And this was the general concept. Here we have a capillary containing red blood cells, plasma and albumin. These capillaries have an arterial and venous end and are lined with endothelial cells. These cells have gaps in between them with interstitial tissue on the other side of the cells. In muscle connective tissue in the lungs, these gaps are frequent and large. But in the brain, they're infrequent and small, which we know as the blood-brain barrier. And we were taught that there's a hydrostatic pressure gradient from the capillaries to the interstitium down which fluid leaks at the arterial side of the circulation and an opposing colloid osmotic pressure gradient that draws fluid back into the vessels at the venous end. Any excess fluid is returned to the circulation in the great veins by the lymphatics. But we now have a better understanding of this fluid flux on what has been called the revised or extended Starling principle. We now know that capillaries are lined by a spongy layer called the glycocalyx. This contains water in a gel phase. Now it's tricky to measure, but it probably contains around one liter of the intravascular volume, which as it's in a gel phase, is not free flowing like the rest of the plasma. In contrast to what we learned in medical school, we now know that capillary pressures just exceed colloid osmotic pressures down their length. And this means filtration of fluid from the vessels to the interstitium occurs down the whole length of capillaries at arterial and venous ends. No fluid is reabsorbed back into the capillaries. It's all removed by the lymphatics. Now, albumin has a vital role in all of this. The glycocalyx traps albumin in its outer layer, but it is able to cross into the interstitium through occasional large gaps. And in fact, 60% of albumin is located in the interstitial space, while only 40% is found in the plasma. And like the plasma filtrate, it's also taken back to the circulation via lymphatics. The jet of water molecules passing through the small pores prevents much albumin diffusing back up the endothelial clefts to the underside of the glycocalyx. So the colloid osmotic pressure gradients across the glycocalyx is significant and exists between the plasma and the relatively protein-free endothelial clefts. The significance of this is that it limits filtration to just a few mils per minute, with the plasma volume leaving the circulation once every nine hours. There is an exception to this though. When capillary pressures become very low, for example in acute hypovolemia, hydrostatic pressure falls and the colloid osmotic pressure gradient now exceeds hydrostatic pressure, which causes flow from the interstitium back into the plasma. This is only transient, however, as albumin molecules diffuse back up to the subglycocalyx space, thus abolishing the oncotic pressure gradient and stopping more reabsorption. In clinical practice, this transient reabsorption allows around 500 mL of fluid back into the circulation before this ceases. So it is, in effect, a protective mechanism in hypovolemia. Now remember, I said filtration normally occurs at pretty low levels because of the high colloid osmotic pressure gradient across the glycocalyx. Well, we can plot this on a graph of filtration by capillary pressure. As well as the filtration rate being low, the increase in filtration with increasing capillary pressures is also initially low, as you can see here with the relatively flat line. 
And this is because as flow of fluid through the endothelial clefts increases, the small amount of albumin there is washed out, so the oncotic pressure gradient opposing filtration gradually increases. Once though all the albumin has been washed out, there can be no further increase in the colloid osmotic pressure gradient and filtration rapidly increases. And this transition point is known as the J point. With normovolemia, capillary pressures are fairly close to the J point in this sort of region. So how is all this relevant clinically? Well, let's see what happens when we give IV fluid in different situations. In normovolemia, infusion of crystalloid will raise capillary pressures and reduce oncotic pressure. As normovolemia lies close to the J point, the result will be increased filtration of fluid from the vessels into the interstitium. And up to a point, this will be easily taken care of by increased lymphatic flow. In hypovolemia, compensatory vasoconstriction lowers capillary pressures and filtration out of vessels ceases. And this state is far to the left of the J point. As you resuscitate your patient, the infused fluid will be retained in the vessels until the capillary pressure of the J point is exceeded. So if your patient is hypovolemic, any fluid you give, even if it's 5% glucose, will be retained in the vessels until you reach euvolemia. After all, without IV fluid, we can replenish plasma volume simply by drinking water. Now what about if we infuse too much fluid, causing hypervolemia? Well here the J point can be exceeded enough to overwhelm lymphatic return, and edema will result. And this leads us on to the big misconceptions many of us have about leaky capillaries in sepsis. Fluid leak, remember, occurs all the time, albeit usually at a fairly low level. Inflammatory states, such as sepsis, increase the rate significantly by damaging the glycocalyx and increasing capillary pressures. This has been confirmed by studies showing that the albumin escape rate increases from 5% an hour in health to around 15% in septic shock. This means that the curve is effectively moved to the left so that for a given capillary pressure, more filtration is occurring. The implications of this are poorly understood, however. The same study demonstrating increased albumin escape rates in sepsis identified many patients with similar amounts of capillary leak who were simply post-op from relatively minor surgery or who were sitting on cancer warts. All were well and none were edematous. We see this in septic patients when they first present to hospital. None of them are edematous. They often are later after four, five, six liters of fluid, but not before this is given. Lymphatic return is able to deal fairly easily with the levels of increased filtration you get in sepsis. It seems you have to be somewhere to the right of this graph with high capillary pressures or complete endothelial failure to become edematous. This means septic patients are not hypovolemic. It's only in states of massive capillary leak, like in the very rare Clarkson's disease or anaphylaxis, that hypovolemia can result from leaky capillaries. And these patients have two things in common on presentation. They have edema and high hematocrits from hemoconcentration. Septic patients don't. So, does this mean then that leaky capillaries aren't important? Certainly not. Bear in mind, I said that sepsis moves the curve left. And while this is not enough to cause overwhelming fluid leak by itself, if you raise capillary pressures with IV fluid, especially if you give it quickly, this combined with increased leakiness overwhelms the system. And this is borne out by evidence that shows us that while 15% of a crystalloid bolus remains in the circulation after three hours in a healthy volunteer, only 5% remains in a septic patient after as little as 30 minutes. So if you give a septic or pancreatitic patient a litre of saline or Hartmann's, 950 mils of it will be in their interstitium in less than an hour. So what do we do then if our septic patient is hypotensive? We know that they're not hypovolemic and we know that any IV fluid we give them will just leak out. 
or thankfully vasopressors by their alpha adrenergic action, as well as increasing blood pressure, actually reduce capillary pressures and therefore filtration and edema. So in summary, filtration occurs down the whole length of capillaries. Any infused fluid will stay in the vessels in hypovolemia, but will leak out when there is not hypovolemia. Sepsis and pancreatitis don't cause hypovolemia and we should use vasopressors, not fluids for these. And some of you may have already deduced that giving albumin is a complete waste of time and money. And just like for global hemodynamics, the microcirculation works best at you for lemia. Thank you very much for listening. And if you're interested in this sort of stuff, follow me on Twitter.